Welcome to Discovery Church. How many excited to be in the house of God today? Amen? All right. I'm excited you're here. We started this series last week called Prophesy the Promise. We start, if you miss it, go check it out. Um, you don't have to be a prophet to prophesy. What we're learning in this series is that you can actually prophesy, man. You can declare some things that are not as though they were. How many of you know that? That you can do that. Now, I'm not saying just pick things out and just like name it and claim it or anything. That's not where we're, we're not prosperity gospel here or anything like that. But what, what I am saying is you can declare the word of God to fulfill in your life. The Bible says that God's word will not turn back, return back void. That you can declare the promises that God has made in his word fulfilled in your life. Now, we talked about last week. Let me just set it up, though. There's, there's, God makes unconditional promises and, and conditional promises. The unconditional promises are the ones that he has made, and he said, hey, this is going to return back, not return back to me void. There's nothing you can do about it. It's not connected to you. There's nothing anyone can do. I am going to fulfill my word. This is going to happen. It's an unconditional promise. Then there are over 7,000 conditional promises in the Bible that are waiting for your faith to meet that promise. And so we're looking at some of those and saying, hey, how can we, how can we uh, prophesy, declare these promises God has made into our life? And so a key thought, though, in this series is you can't prophesy the promise unless you, unless you practice the principles, okay? That's a key thought in this series that we need to kind of come back to over and over again. There are principles that we need to live by if we want to prophesy God's promises. Let me share with you our theme verse in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. It says, God made all these great, all these great 7,000 plus marvelous promises so that his nature would become part of us. Don't you file that away, that God made these promises so that we would become like him. Now, what do you think that, that God promised the most in the Bible? What was it connected to? Out of all the promises he could, he, he could make, what do you think it was connected to? It wasn't, it wasn't connected to your faith, not love, not patience, not peace, not hope, none of those things. The, most of the promises of God are connected to, you ready for this? Your generosity. Today, I want to I teach you how to prophesy the promises of God over your finances. Can I help you do that today? Amen, you guys? Because there are some promises that God has made that are connected to your generosity and to, toward the stewardship of your finances. And that's a key word, stewardship, okay? Because, again, you, cannot, you can't prophesy the promises if you aren't going to practice the principles. So I actually, before I teach you the, 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 the promises that you can prophesy, God's blessing in your life over your finances. I want to just take a few moments to teach you some principles of God's word about your finances, some principles of God's word about your finances so you can start prophesying some things that God has promised in your life. I want to show you 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's important to note about this verse though. This Paul is writing this letter that we call 1 Timothy. I actually wrote another one called 2 Timothy. And the reason why it's that name, Timothy, is because he's writing a letter to a person. He's a pastor of a, of a local church, a congregation. And so Paul is telling, hey, Timothy, to your congregation, I want you to be able to preach some things. I want you to, hear, I want you to preach some things from time to time. You need to, you need to teach your church about this. In fact, he goes this far to say, hey, Pastor Timothy, Paul's saying, command those. Don't, don't just teach them. But he's saying, Pastor Timothy, you need to command those who are rich in this present world. And that's where some of you check out. You go, well, this ain't for me. This is somebody else. He's talking to somebody else, right? He ain't talking to me right there. Paul's, Timothy must be talking to somebody else. Come, I'm going to help you out in a moment, okay? Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. So there's this tendency to easily migrate our hope from God to our hope in things. Thinking that if we had enough wealth, it would give me more security, more safety, more of a net. And so he says, hey, be careful. You got to command those. Some people who are rich in this world, tell them not to be arrogant, Timothy. Tell them not to put their hope in wealth because it's so uncertain. But he, what is what he says, put their hope in God. You got to continue to remind them, Pastor Timothy, because people are going to forget. Don't put your hope in those things. Put your hope in God. He's the only sure source of your hope who richly provides us everything. Look at this. For our what? Enjoyment. Hey, did you know that God doesn't mind you enjoying your life? God doesn't mind you enjoying things. He doesn't mind that at all. He actually provided you things for you to enjoy. But then he, he's, he's trying to contextualize this. But command them to do good 
and to be rich in good deeds. And it's not just about your finances and generosity. He's just saying like, but be good. Just be a good person. Do good things. Be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. And then he says, because if they do this in this way, they're going to lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is really, truly life. So he's saying these are the people that they actually, they figured out what life is, what life is really all about. And this is why this topic is so important in our culture today, in our, the world we live in today, because in the world we live in today, the, look, this is, this is statistically true. The more Americans make, the less they give. You would think it was the opposite. I know, it's surprising. Like, what do you mean the more Americans make, the actual less they give? No, it's, it's, it is a statistical fact that the, the biggest givers are those who make the least amount of money in this country. Isn't that, isn't that shocking? It shocked me when I, when I that, that the more some the Americans make, the more we withhold. So they did this Gallup poll. I was researching this. They did a poll of all the Americans, and they asked the American population, how much does somebody need to make in order to be considered rich? What is, what is rich? You know what they said? They said, the American people said, that rich, you're rich if you make $150,000, then you're rich. And some of you look at that and you're thinking, yeah, because I don't make that much. That's rich. That is rich. I'm not making that. But, but if you were to ask the $150,000 wage earners, they don't think they're rich. They say, oh, no, we got tough times too. There are times where we struggle. There's times where we're... So, so what they did is they, the same Gallup poll, they asked Americans that earn between thirty dollars and $35,000 a year in household income. They said, what does it take to be, how much do you have to earn to be rich. And they said, you have to make $75,000. If you're $75,000 wage earning household income, you're rich. To which some of you are laughing inside right now because you're like, I make that much and I ain't rich. That's, that's not, I'm not, my home makes it and that's not me. Okay. So here's the deal. They then ask some people that subscribe, all the people that subscribe to Money Magazine. No, I don't subscribe to Money Magazine, but I guess you're rich. You're rich if you a lot of rich people subscribe to Money Magazine. And so they asked them, they polled them, how much does somebody have to make in an annual income of all assets, liquid, all the assets? How, how much does someone have to have in order to be rich? You know what these guys said? They said $5 million. You got to have $5 million in order to be rich. Come on, somebody. That's stinking rich right there, right? Right? But then if you ask them, guess what they say? Oh, no, we're not rich. We're not rich. Because, no, no, trust me, it's, we, got some, we got some times that, that we run into. Here's, and here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. Nobody is rich, but everybody knows someone who is. That's the bottom line. <laughs> Riches is, is like an elusive. And here's, here's the problem with this, you guys, is you don't know how rich you are, church. You don't know. You just don't know how rich you are. And because of that, listen to me, because of that, you're not stewarding your blessings appropriately. You're not stewarding the richness that God has given you. And to some of you, you still think like, yeah, this message ain't for me. I ain't rich. That's somebody else. That's somebody else in my row. It ain't, it ain't me. Listen, if there's, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove to you that you are rich. You're a rich person. Okay? If you are, if you make in household income, annual income household, you and all your house, if you make anywhere from forty dollars to $48,000 a year in annual income household, check this out, you are in the top one percent in the world of wage earners you're you are the elite in our world the richest in our world and that and that should shock you that's the response i thought i would get none of you went praise god i came in here thought i was broke but pastor said i was rich i'm not i'm leaving a rich man hallelujah none of you did that you know why because you don't think you're rich you don't think you're rich. You don't believe you're rich. So you're not stewarding your richness the way that you should be stewarding your richness. Okay, so let me, let me help you out because there's, there's some ways that we need to use money. All of us use money. All of us use money. Some of us use it differently than others. Some of us are good stewards. Some of us pack, practice better biblical principles than, than, than others. Some of us, but there's three ways you can use money. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping today that that. I want to lead you to use all three of these, that your money would be used in, in three areas of your life. But the sad reality is most people only see the first area 
that your money is used for and, and nothing else. Okay, write these down, three areas your money is used for, and it should be, but we don't get beyond this first step. Write it down like this. We can spend it, and some of us do that real good. Amen, somebody? We spend that money. As fast as it come in, it's leaving out. I don't, then you get a raise, you get a raise, you get a, you, but then you get more new stuff. And then it's like, as fast as it comes in again, it was some cushion for a little bit, but then you raised your standard of living when you raised your standard of giving, and it just now is leaving again. It's leaving again, and you're paycheck to paycheck. Most Americans live paycheck to paycheck. We spend it. Now, you're not going to get away from this. We're going to spend money. You're going to spend money. It's just... What I want you to do is just spend more wisely. To know, you should know where your money's going. You should know where you are spending your, your money. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Solomon, the wisest person that ever lived, wrote this book of the Bible. He says, those who love money, not use money, not spend money, those who love money. And, and the Paul, Paul, the apostle Paul told Timothy later in a different verse, he said, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. Money's not the root. Money's not evil. It's, it's, it's indifference. It's just paper, you guys. It's, it's the way that, that money affects our heart. It's the way that we're using money that becomes evil. And, and Solomon says, man, those who love money, they'll never have enough. That kind of agrees with that Gallup poll, doesn't it? It's just, oh, that's not me. I need more. Oh, no, I'm not rich. Something else is rich. Uh, uh, no, no, no. I need more. I need more. How much, how, how meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness, which is a lot of people think. Sometimes we get sucked into that, right? If I just had, oh, if we could just do the Christmas like, if I could just have a little bit more, if I could get that, oh, it would, it would make, I would be, we would be happy. If I had just a little bit more room and margin. The more you have, though, the more people come to help you spend it. Come on, somebody. Isn't that true? So, he says, what good is wealth except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers? People, he says, who, who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much, but the rich seldom get a good night's sleep, he says. Ain't that the truth, you guys? So, in other words, you thought you needed more, but it didn't quench the thirst. It didn't scratch. Like, like, you thought, oh, it was more, but then when you got there, it was like, wait, this isn't it. This isn't what I... I thought it would be. So you get to Christmas 2019, and it's got to be better than Christmas 2018. And that one's got to be better than Christmas 20. And we got to have more. We got to go bigger. We got to go better. We got to go more. And we got to. And the kids got. They need better toys and bigger toys and more toys. And at the end of the day, you ain't gonna stop it. They're gonna play with the boxes. Okay? They're gonna play with the bubble wrap. You ought to think about that before you go getting into debt. So getting into debt for Christmas. My goodness, you guys, and we're wasting, we're wasting, and our money is slipping through our fingers because we're not stewarding our richness. And rich people are funny. they rich people are funny. They got, rich people have what's called the spirit of discontentment. And they're funny with it, though. I, mean, I know you guys maybe not do this, but rich people are funny. Rich people have this word called upgrade. It's a funny word, man. Here's what they do. Check this out. They take perfectly good words working things and they'll trade it in for things that do the same thing but spend more money right. aren't rich people crazy <laughs> here so they'll take their car a perf a working car it gets from a to b it, gets, it does it runs on gas the same gas <laughs> they'll take that car and they'll take it into a dealership and they'll walk away from that dealership with another car that does the same thing but more debt aren't rich people crazy or here, here's the rich people, they take their kitchen. Oh, yeah, I'm coming after you now. With, I mean, the kitchen, it's got, it's got countertops, that work. It's got the stove, that works. It's got a fridge, that works. Here's what rich people do. I know you guys don't do this, but these guys, they're crazy. They take that working condition kitchen. They rip it all out. And then guess what they put in? Another working countertop, working stove, and working refrigerator. Aren't rich people crazy, man? <laughs> or here's what they'll do. Here's, here's what rich people do. They, they, got, they got a walk-in closet. They ain't never heard of that 20, 30, 40 years ago. Walk-in closet. Some of you got closets my kids could sleep in. You know what I mean? They walk into this closet, and they got clothes everywhere. But rich people are crazy. They walk in the closet, clothes everywhere, and they say, I have nothing to wear. Rich people are crazy, man. Rich people, man, they're just... So here's, here's the bottom line. The more stuff a person has, 
the more he or she wants. And that is the truth. That's the crazy thing about an appetite. When you satisfy an appetite, the appetite doesn't really go away, does it? It just, it just gets covered over for a little bit. It comes back with a force, doesn't it? So when you, when you satisfy that appetite for that, you know, Krispy Kreme filled chocolate donut. Come on, somebody. Take us to heaven right now. Altar calls happening. Let's go. Krispy so I had one of those a couple days ago, a Krispy Kreme, chocolate, cream field, you know, cream field, oh, donut, and, and I don't have my, but when I do, it satisfies me, it is, but, but I end up a day, maybe two days later, I'm dreaming about Krispy Kreme donuts. That's a crazy thing about appetites. When you fulfill the desire, it doesn't go away, it grows. It grows. The appetite that you, that you fulfill does not go away. The more stuff a person has, you think you're, you're going to get to that place and go, I've arrived. No, you actually just satisfied an unhealthy desire. And when you arrive there, it may, it may, it may cover over just for a few days, a few months, but you're going to want what? More. Always more, always more. We need to, we need to, we need to just move and, and be able to be able to grow from this just spending and wasting everything away. There's two other areas that I want you to know that if you want to practice good biblical stewardship so that you can prophesy the, the, the promises of God over your life, you got to get away from just spending everything. Here's the next two things you need to do. Number two, you need to start saving some, church. You need to put some away. Stop eating a fool eats all the harvest, okay? You got you to gotta save some of the harvest to plant in the next season so that there's more harvest coming in. But we just foolishly eat and foolishly eat. Now, save it. There's a, you should be saving a percentage of your income. You, you should. But here, if I could speak to this in a moment. So, some people think, though, that they can save their self to safety. That if I just had enough, if I had enough savings, I could be secure. I could insulate myself from all calamities and crisis and disaster. If I could build up enough, we even have a term for it. We say, I just want to be financially secure. Yeah? Financially secure. As if anyone could ever be really financially secure. Proverbs chapter 18. The wealth of the rich is their fortified cities. So that's what we think. Some people think we can fortify ourselves. If I just had enough, I could fortify myself. I, I, they imagine a wall that's too high to scale. If I just build enough, it could be a wall. No bad things can touch me. No bad things can happen to me if I just build up this wall high enough. So let me ask you a question. Here, ponder this question, okay? How much money would you need to secure your future against all imaginable eventualities? Think about that. How much would you money would you need to secure your future against all imaginable eventualities? Here's the answer. The answer is more than you currently have. It's always elusive. Now, look, I have a savings account. The Bible, look, it's good stewardship to have. And the Bible says store up treasures for your children and your children's children. So it's good. To, but the Bible does also warn that we can migrate our hope, doesn't it? That our hope can migrate away from the one where our hope is supposed in the one true God oh, migrate into the things of this world where we put our hope and our security in things that are so, Paul says, uncertain. But you need to, you should be saving some. You, you, you're spending it. You, yeah, we're going to spend it, but you should be spending wisely. We should get to a place where we are saving intentionally so that you can practice this third principle of biblical stewardship and that is you can start sowing some seed generously you can yeah spend it but we got to save some of it and then we sow some of it this is a spiritual law called the law of sowing and reaping that's a spiritual law that's in practice there's an old saying that says anybody can count the seeds in an apple but only god can count the apples in a seed that, that's the, the exponential power of the seed. See, when you plant a seed in the ground, you don't just get, I plant an apple seed in the ground, I don't, I don't just get one apple, right? I get a tree. I get a harvest of apples coming back to me. The seed has exponential power to produce harvest in our life when it is sown in fertile soil. 
2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. I'm going to show you Bible on this, okay? Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly, whoever plants a few seeds, is only going to get a few seeds back. That's true in every area of your life. Whatever, And whoever sows generously will also reap generously, okay? Now, let me just remind you. This is the law of sowing and reaping, not the law of the microwave. Some of you, some of you are looking for microwave success, and we serve a God of seasons, Pastor, I, I didn't get a job. I don't have a job yet. Now, why, what do you, the promises of God aren't working. What do you mean the promise? I started tithing last month. What? You, okay, listen. You think that, that you are going to negate 35 years of bad debt and bad stewardship over one month of proper stewardship. Don't fool yourself. It's the law of sowing and reaping. Just start sowing that seed in the soil. I promise you, you will reap a harvest in due season. Okay. What you'll see for a season, though, is a lot of the other stuff you've been sowing for a long time. That's what's gonna, it's, it's the law of sowing and reaping, not the law of the microwave. You want microwave success, fruit ripen slowly. And, and by the way, God, can I just say, God is not your slot machine. He's not your genie. You don't, he don't serve you. You serve God. Amen, somebody? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, he goes on. He says, just as God gives seed to farmers and bread for food... God gives you seed to do what? To plant. God is giving you seed. We just, we're eating all of our seeds. Some of us save some of it. But he actually gives you seed to sow. That's why he gives you seed. So that you can sow. Seed to plant. Then he makes it grow so that there's a great harvest from your generosity. And God, he says, will make you rich enough to be generous at all times. What he's basically saying there is you cannot outgive God. Amen. You can't. See, Giving is not a debt I owe. It's a seed I sow. Amen, somebody? Come on, receive that. Here's the secret to a bigger harvest. The secret to a bigger harvest is I can increase my harvest by sowing more seed. Doesn't that make sense? The more seed I sow into the soil, the more harvest. This is called, if you want to research this later, the theological term is called the law of proportion. The law of proportion says I will reap an exponential proportion of anything I sow. This is true in every area of your life every area if you want more energy you want some more energy in your life sow some energy and you'll reap more energy in return this works i'm telling you keep keep sitting on the couch and watching all those movies playing all those games eating potato chips i promise you're not going to get any energy sown to you but get yourself up and sow some energy on that treadmill i promise you you'll get energy sown back into you in exponential form are you, okay, you see this? Any, any, any area, any area. You want, you want some more love in your life? Start sowing some love into that woman, and you'll get some love back. Start, so you want more kindness? Start sowing kindness. You want, more, you want more favor? Start giving some favor away, and favor will come back. Any area of your life, you sow, you will reap a harvest in exponential proportion of any seed that you sow. Here's the problem. We naturally want to consume all the seed. We naturally just want to eat it all. We consume it all. But, but what if we didn't consume it all? What if as, as God raised our standard of living, we just didn't raise our standard of living when we got to increase. We raised our standard of giving. Amen. That we're able to sow even more and more. Here, let me give you this thought connected to this message today. I, I told you something like this last week, but let me connect it to our talk today. You can't prophesy God's promises over your finances if you aren't willing to practice God's principles for your finances. I'm trying to help you get to all three of these spheres of where your money can be used when you practice good principles, when you practice biblical principles. You gotta practice the principles of God's word in your finances. If you want to prophesy God's promises over your finances. Now I know this area brings a little bit of tension. I get it, I get it, because some of us, because of religion, the misuse and abuse of this topic of, of giving and generosity and finances has, has created, myself included for many years, a weariness. I just, there was like a whole, the whole first year of discovery, we didn't even pick up any tithes and offering. It was just like, no, give in the back and just like, we didn't even, I didn't even talk about it that much. And God convicted me after a year and he said, how come you're not teaching my people my heart? You see, look, the reason why he's given us these promises in our theme verse is so that his nature can become God. Like, do you guys know that God is a generous God? 
And the reason why he gives us these promises connected to our generosity, I'm about to share with you, is so that we can take on his nature, that he wants us to be generous because he is generous. And as we practice these promises in our life, his nature becomes like us and we become generous like our God is generous. So I had to repent. I said, God, forgive me for not, for not, not sharing the principles of your word to your people and trusting you with the results. I recognize the tension you feel because a lot of us can, can connect godliness to sacrifice better than we can connect godliness to blessing and provision. And, and look, none of you are wrong. Those of you, some of you can, can do one or the other. None of you are wrong. You're both right because God does want you to sacrifice. And there are some areas of life that need to live with sacrifice, okay? And then, yes, God does want to bless you and he wants to provide you. He's God, you're a provider, absolutely. But here's where we get messed up because God doesn't always provide. Some, some seasons are not going to look like, God, you're, this doesn't feel like a blessing. God, why didn't you provide? Some seasons are going to happen like that. And in like manner, there's going to be some seasons where God says, I don't need you living out of a box. I provided you good things for your enjoyment. Are you seeing this, you guys? There's, it's, it's a duality. I'm not saying it's either or. It's both and. You've got to practice all the counsel, the full counsel of, God, of God's word to walk in full alignment with God's word. Okay? So let me, let me give to you the, the promises you can prophesy over your finances if you are practicing God's stewardship, his principles of stewardship and contentment. If you can practice his principles, you can prophesy the promises. Write them down. Here's number one. For those who are generous, God says, I promise good things will happen in your life. Isn't that an amazing promise? That God says, look, if you're going to be generous, if you're going to have my heart and be generous, good things are going to come back into, sown into your life. Psalm 112 says, good will come to him who is what? That's an amazing promise. Like good, God says, if I'm generous, I'm going to get good. Proverbs 22. Generous people will be what? Blessed. Will be blessed. That's a promise. Man, and if you, if you want to be uh, reap the blessings and the goodness of God, generosity is the key that unlocks that door, church. God says, I promise. That's a promise you can prophesy. You practice the principles, you can prophesy goodness coming into your life. Amen? Here's a second promise. God promises, for those who are generous, he promises, your children will be blessed. Your children will either, I said last week, your children will either inherit God's promises or your fears. And, and uh, I talked to some of you after last week, and you know what I found out? Is that there's a lot of fear associated with this topic today. That some of you found out that your fear has to do with your finances. Whether you'll have enough, get enough, make enough, your future is uncertain because of finances, or, or if you could trust God fully with it. And it's a fear that's on it. Can I really trust God? God promises that not only will your life, there'll be, there'll be blessing in your life if you are generous, but he says, I'll pass the blessing on to your children and your children. It'll be a legacy of generosity. Psalm 37, 26 says that the godly are what? Always generous. That, that, that why is that? Because God is generous. That the godly, if we take on the nature of God, we are going to be always generous and their children will be blessed. God is saying, I'll pour it back into your kids' life. How many of you want your kids to be blessed? Listen, your kids, please listen to me. Your kids are not going to be blessed by a bigger Christmas. Look, the problem is we compare, we compare God's blessings to culture's pleasures. Come on, somebody. You need to get off that, that wheel, okay? That is not, that is not what God con considers blessed. Bigger and better and more and greater. Your kid, that's not the blessing that God wants to pass down. If you would just model generosity, if you would just teach your children generosity, you would be passing down a legacy of generosity into your children and their children, and they can claim these promises as their own because you, because you model them. Here's, here's a third promise. God says, if you're generous, God promises, I'll be happier. I'll be happier. Now, that word happy comes from an old English word, hap. It means circumstances. Like lucky is what it means. So, so God is saying here, understand, happiness and joy are not the same thing. Joy is not circumstantial. I can experience joy in the middle of a fire and trial and difficulty and lack and I don't have the provision. I can have the joy of God. It's not circumstantial. Happiness is circumstantial. 
And this is what God is saying. God is promising, check it out, that you will be circumstantially happier. Look at this verse, Acts 20. Luke is writing this and he's remembering what Jesus said. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus who said this. There is more what? There's more, ha Jesus is saying, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. So, so Jesus is going, you have a better chance at being happy if you are generous than if you are stingy. Right. This is what Jesus is saying. You, your, your chances go up dramatically of having a happy life if you are generous instead of stingy. That's what he's saying. See, when I was a kid, I'd rather get Christmas gifts than give Christmas gifts. But then, but then it's a sign of maturity. It's a sign of like when, when someone has grown up, when they actually can, can know and believe and live by, that it truly is more blessed to give than to receive. Isn't that, isn't that? That's a sign of maturity that someone says, no, no, no. I'm actually more blessed when I'm giving than I am receiving. God promises that if I'm generous, I, I have a better chance at being happy in my life. Here's the fourth promise. If you're generous, God says, God promises to meet all my, what? Notice I didn't say greeds. God didn't ever promise to meet your greeds. There are some needs that you think there are needs. There ain't needs, okay? You, you think there are needs. That's not a need. God promises, though, to meet all of my needs. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, you should give as you've decided in your heart to give. Never give reluctantly or under pressure. Now, that's like... It, you should never give. If someone is twisting your arm, you feel pressured, it don't count. You shouldn't give. He's, God says, I want you to give from your heart. I want you to decide something. I want no one else to decide something for you. Decide something for yourself, what you're going to bring to me, because God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Then he says, that's, that's the premise. Do that. Here's the promise. Then, then God will generously provide for you, so that in all things, at all times, you'll have all look at all the alls in that verse man god is leaving no wiggle room here he's just saying look if you just decide in your heart to worship me and be generous i make a promise to you all things all times you're gonna have all that you need and plenty left over so that you can continue to be generous on every occasion listen let me just ask you a simple question do you believe that do you believe it Okay, because it's there, guys. This is there. I, wa I want you to walk in the blessing and the, under, the, under the, the promises, the covering of God. Do you, do you really believe and practice God's word as it's connected to your generosity? Here's the fifth, the fifth promise. God says, if you're going to be generous, I promise that that giving is going to be stored up in heaven. That you're not really giving it away, you're storing it up. Okay, you're, store, you're, you're not giving it away. You're storing it up somewhere. There's actually five different times in the Gospels. Five times Jesus says this phrase, store up treasure in heaven. Five different times on five different occasions, store up treasures in heaven. You guys should be more concerned with your heavenly retirement account than your earthly retirement account. I'm just saying. Like this is, this is a big deal. God is saying five times. You say, well, how do I store up? treasures in heaven where well, you can't take it with you but you can send it ahead of you jesus said it this way in luke 16 9 he says you use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends now what does he mean by that now he says he's going to tell you what he means in the second sentence look in this way your generosity stores up a reward for you in heaven so what he's saying is use your resources to get people saved you, you use as your resources to, 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 so that people would know me and receive me and go to heaven one day. Use your resources to store up e in eternity, an in investment in eternity. Now, if we're honest, a lot of us, you know, we're not in those three categories. Like span, you know, save, and so a lot of us, we just live in span, man. Actually, statistically, Americans, 70% of Americans only have a couple hundred dollars in their bank in their savings account saved up 34 percent have zero zero so we can't even move into sowing because we're consuming all the seed we're consuming all the harvest now i, I went to target how many y'all love target anyone love target up in here I went to target and and i found this um 
invention. It's changing my life, this invention. It is helping me save so much money and resources, and, and, and I want to I pass on this blessing to you. Check this out, man. Come on, somebody. It's a coffee maker. That's changing my life. The average American spends anywhere from $1 to $200 on, on needless drinks a month. Even at 100, that's like three, $3 and some change a day. I spoke to one person last week. They said they spend $400 on Starbucks a month. Wow. You gawk at that. You go look. You go look what you're spending on. I spent, uh, I looked at mine a couple months ago. And I'm just telling you, this is, this is what the Lord told me. Starbucks is robbing your stewardship. Come on, somebody. Okay? And, and I don't know what your... What is robbing your stewardship? But here's the problem. We go and worship at the altar of our pleasures. And when it comes time to worship at the altar of God, we have nothing left. And so I just decided, man, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be wasteful anymore. That's for me, it's anywhere from one to two hundred dollars a month I was spending just on Starbucks. I said, you know what? That is such a wastefulness. I could be putting that money to use in so much better ways. I could make my own coffee for 50 cents. 50 cents I could make my own coffee. So, you say, okay, what's, what's, I want to start, I want to move from just being a spender to a saver and a sower, man. I want to see this happen in my life. I want to bring my life into alignment. Biblical principles in my life. I want to do it. What's my starting point? Fill this out. This is your starting point. Tithing, 10%. The Bible says over and over and over, the tithe belongs to God. Over and over, if you make $10, the first dollar belongs to God. It's His. It is holy and it's his. So, so you say, look, the, you, can, you cannot be generous if you're robbing God. Come on. You can't. The tithe means 10%. The ten, that's what it means, a tenth. So here's, and God gets serious on this, man. He gets, in Malachi chapter 3, he gets real serious. And this is another promise, of, but it begins with the premise. And he's even getting, he gets really negative at first. He says, is it right to rob God? Is it right? And that's just a question he poses. I don't want you to think about that. Is it right to rob God? And then he goes, yeah, you are robbing me, says the Lord. Wait a second. How, how, how are we robbing you, God? What do you mean we're robbing you? I, don't, I didn't pick your pockets, God. And God says, well, you're robbing me. Go ahead. By not returning the tithes and the offering. And then he says this. Okay. Bring the whole tithe. That's, look, 1% is not a tithe. 5% is not a tithe. A tithe is 10%. That's what, a, that's what a tithe is. Into where? My storehouse, that there may be food in what? Notice the place. I bring my worship to my place of worship. Okay? You, look, your, your tithe doesn't go to United Way or Salvation Army. That's God's. This is, God says that tithe, that, that verse 10, it belongs to me. And you're here to bring it. The first is mine. And then, can you, can you imagine? Americans, American Christians, five, only 5% tithe. Can you imagine the impact that we could make in this world if we, because some of us, some of us have trusted, which is silly. It's so silly. Some of you have trusted God enough to save your eternal soul, but you're hesitant to trust him with your finances. Right. Isn't that just, does it, doesn't make sense. That God's promises would, would not be faithful in every area of your life. It doesn't make sense. And then God says, look, because I know the enemy is crafty here, I want you to test me in this, he says. Go ahead, put it to the test, and see. Here's the, the, that was the, the premise. God says, bring that whole thing, man. Bring it to my house, all 10%. You can test me in this, and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing. That word pour out is overflow. The picture here, the word picture, is this Jewish cup called a hadish. And, and, and the Hadish cup would sit on this plate. And it was a tiny cup, and it, it would, that plate would catch the, the Hadish would catch the overflow. That's what it means, to, to pour over, to pour out, is the overflow. Look, God, 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 I promise you, you, you practice the principles. God will bring overflow into your life. The problem with our culture, American culture, we, we, don't, we don't like the size of the cup. We have a big gulp culture. That's right. And expect, and expect and overflow God. 
No, no, no. See, God says, no, I'll bring overflow in your life when you decrease the size of your cup. Decrease the size of your cup, and I'll pour it over in every area of your life. I'll pour out blessing if you stop drinking from a big gulp and drink from the Hadish, the overflow. I'll pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room for you to store it. And then he says, I'll even prevent pests from devouring your crops. Did you know that when you don't bring the tithe, like, it goes somewhere. God will allow it to go somewhere. He said, look, you ain't going to give them to me. I ain't going to let you use it. The car's going to break down. The roof's going to leak. The problem's over here. The problem's over there. I ain't going to let you use it. I'm going to let the pests have it. I'm going to let the enemy, the devourer, have that thing. And then he says, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. That's the whole purpose. Can you imagine what would it look like if we put God first? If we lived God first lives. Listen, show me your calendar and your bank account, and I'll tell you who your God is. Come on, bring it. Bring it. Look, I just, some of you, I just love God so much. He, God will start with wherever you are, and he'll lead you to where you need to be. Some of you, this, is, this, is, this level of obedience is beyond your level of faith right now, and that's okay. That's okay. Look, we love you. And if this is a struggle for you right now, it's okay. Go on this journey. Just go on a journey with us of saying yes to God. I promise you he'll prove faithful to you. Ain't no one need to twist your arm. No one to, you don't need to feel like, like there's arm twisting. I'm just trying to be a faithful pastor for you. I'm trying to be a good pastor for you. I'm trying to fulfill the word of God where Paul told Timothy, hey, every now and then you got to preach on this topic because people don't know how rich they are. Amen. And I'm just, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to help you, church, so that you can stop just spending, get to a place where you spend wisely, save intentionally, and sow generously. Can I pray for you guys? Let me pray for you all across.